If I could make like a 54 man roster, maybe 55, I'd be golden. But, uh, yeah, Packers have got a lot of young talent. This is going to be tough. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lombardi Time Brews, where I'm your host, John Delray. Today, going over attempting to predict the 53-man roster, and I will admit, right up here, right up front, this is going to be wrong. Like, I just fully acknowledge that, but I'm going to say that a lot of these guesses are incredibly well-educated. We know what the Packers have done historically. We know the rotations that they've been utilizing to this point, but I think... There's going to be a few surprises this year. Not to mention, there's also a bunch of young talent on this team. For instance, last night, there was quite a bit of UDFA talent on the field. Well, but again, comparing that to draft picks, you know, Brian Goodkunst has only ever let go four of his draft picks in the year that they were drafted. And they had 13 draft picks this year. So the likelihood of them hanging on to all 13 isn't exactly high. So there's going to be some things in this roster that don't fit the historical norm for Brian Gutekunst and the Green Bay Packers. Now, obviously, last night they had a 36-19 victory over the Cincinnati Bengals. A lot of impressive play from a lot of different players. And while this isn't a full-on recap, I will mention some players as we go through that stood out last night for one reason or another. So let's get started right away. A lot of stuff to go through. Let's take a look at the quarterback position. Obviously, Jordan Love going to be quarterback one, right? There's no doubt about that. But in terms of how many quarterbacks, I'm actually going to go with two. That's their historical norm. That's what I think we're actually lining up to do again this year. And I think last year or last night was very indicative of that giving Sean Clifford as much playing time as he got and the way that he performed. I don't think there's any doubt about him taking over right after Love that the pecking order is Love, then Clifford, and then Magoo. And Clifford certainly had a lengthy amount of time last night in both time and play calling to show what he can do. And the thing is, he looked good. Like, I know there was a comment just recently on the video that I put out the other day, but like, when did Sean Clifford become baby Brett Favre, right? Like, that is not what we've seen from Sean Clifford before, and certainly to this point in camp. That's not how he was playing in camp, but he basically entered that game last night and said, screw it, I got nothing to lose, and just slung it. Jordan Love, on the other hand, with the starters, if anything, maybe looked a little too apprehensive at times, a little bit of... Like he's trying to run before walking. I think that Musgrave throw is a great example. Dan Orlovsky of ESPN put out a breakdown on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it now. Detailing that on that throw, Love was so focused on keeping his eyes away, drawing the safety away from where he was actually going to throw it, that then when he actually threw it, it was it was off target. Like it's It's like he's trying to do the really advanced stuff before just making the throw, which is not at all a bad sign. So, I think overall, when looking at the quarterback picture, both last night and moving forward, Sean Clifford is quickly proving that he can be a competent and exciting backup. And I think Jordan Love last night proved that in this system, it's going to work. Now, obviously, still a small sample size. Obviously, there's a long ways to go. But we saw it, right? Quick passes. I saw something like on non-play action throws, he got the throw out in 1.76 seconds. That's incredibly good. And something kind of from this Green Bay offense that's at times been lacking in the last few years, not to mention the utilization of the middle of the field. So Love is absolutely unequivocally your quarterback one. I think Clifford is well ahead right now to be quarterback two, and I think they only keep two given how many other spots they need to keep on this roster. Let's take a look at running back. Running back's very, very similar in some regards. The First of all, the depth last night was tremendous, right? We have Patrick Taylor, reliable yet unspectacular, trusted as a pass protector and on special teams. That's why he was basically the running back three last year with some swaps in the practice squad and all that. But then you've got Emmanuel Wilson, who had the breakout game of his life last night. And if you read it all about the emotional uh, things in play there, truly an, an unbelievable night for Emmanuel Wilson, running for over 100 yards, two touchdowns. 
And I've mentioned on this channel before that like he's running better than people are talking about. Now, is he firmly in the conversation for running back three now? I don't know. Because then you also have Lou Nichols, the seventh round draft pick, who's been out for a stretch now with a shoulder injury. And now you got Tyler Goodson, who I actually said when he was running the ball last night, he should be running back three. How can they keep his playmaking off the field? Plus his blocking is getting better. And then he got a shoulder injury, which we have yet to know how severe that is. The overall point being here, the Green Bay Packers have not been afraid in years past to only keep two running backs on the initial 53-man roster, and then use practice squad elevations, temporary signings, all that kind of stuff, to get them a third running back on game days. And what we know right now is that the Packers have four candidates at running back who capably could get onto their practice squad and be elevated on game days. Patrick Taylor, Tyler Goodson, I mean, Goodson was on the squad last year. Why would he not make it to the squad this year, right? Lou Nichols was a seventh-round pick. Seventh-round picks historically have a good chance to get to the practice squad. And Emmanuel Wilson was a UDFA from a tiny little school. Now, if he runs for over 100 yards every single game, that's not going to help. But what I'm saying here is that the Green Bay Packers obviously have Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. And then a wealth of candidates that could be running back three. And because they need spots at other places on the roster, I'm inclined to say again that they're just going to keep two running backs, Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. Then try to retain three, maybe all four, if they're really going for it, on the practice squad. And then use elevations to bring them up for matchup dependent things. Maybe if someone gets hurt, sign one to the active roster. But we're talking initial 53. I think the Green Bay Packers could just be sticking with two and letting the other four go in spite of very strong showings from a number of them thus far. Looking at the fullback position, yeah, because the Packers have a fullback position now? Well, Josiah DeGuara, fullback one, uh, if you want to call him that. Maybe he's still tight end, whatever. He's basically playing fullback, so he makes the roster. I do not believe that Henry Pearson is going to make it, although there are some considerations that I'm going to get to in just one minute. At the wide receiver position, I think they're going to keep six. This fits very much within their norms. That wide receiver six role does play a lot of special teams, which... Getting down there, you've got Watson, Dobbs, Reed, Toure, Wicks. I think all five of them are absolute roster locks. Number six, though, as we know, is a battle between, at this point, Malik Heath and Bo Melton. Maybe mix in a little bit of Grant Dubose, but like he's not there yet coming off of his back injury. And Heath, last night, blocked his tail off. Oh, the comps were out at a live last night for Malik Heath to be compared to Alan Lazard. And we know how much Matt LaFleur loved Alan Lazard. And Matt LaFleur has made several comments about Malik Heath to this point being a real player, right? When he's talked about Bo Melton, it's been, he's scrappy, he's fast. Yeah, Heath and Melton are completely different types of receivers. So when you're looking at that wide receiver six spot, what's it going to come down to? Teams? Maybe blocking ability? Because on teams, Melton probably wins and blocking Heath probably wins. So last night, though, Heath was more of a contributor in the passing game. He blocked. I mean, there was that one clip about him blocking a dude straight out into oblivion. Like, well after the play was done, they're going at it on the sideline. That's the kind of thing that will capture Matt LaFleur's attention, without a doubt. So I have been pounding the table all camp long for Bo Melton. I've been saying Bo Melton has been showing out every day. Heath has been a little quiet. Well, as of late, Heath has come on more and more. And Melton was not as productive as Heath last night. And Heath can play some teams. At least for now, I think I'm going to flip it. Say that wide receiver six for right now goes to Malik Heath, thus leaving Bo Melton off the roster. And Grant DuBose being a draft pick cut along with Lou Nichols. The tight end position, this is where things get very, very curious right now. Tyler Davis was injured last night. In fact, we know by now officially that he tore his ACL and he's going to miss the entire year, which first of all is heartbreaking for Tyler Davis. He was retained on a contract this year after, I mean, like last year he was pumped up all offseason long that he was going to be this thing, right? Then had a god-awful preseason and then continued to work and became the special team snap leader for the Green Bay Packers last year. And now, all of a sudden, this year, he's getting ingrained more in the offense. With DeGuara out with his calf injury lately, Tyler Davis has been doing some of the H-back stuff. He's been getting some snaps with the ones every so often, as Tucker Craft is learning his way. 
And now all of a sudden, now he tears his ACL and he's out for the year. It's, just, it's, it's heartbreaking for guys on the fringe to work their way up and then have an injury that, that's going to be in the way of them accomplishing an upward trajectory as it appeared. So really, at the tight end position, if we're crowning DeGuara as a fullback, you now have Luke Musgrave, Tucker Craft, and then Austin Allen. Now, Wisconsin Badger fans may remember Allen well from a few years ago when he eviscerated the Wisconsin Badger defense, basically all by his lonesome a couple years ago. In fact, I think that was like his career's biggest game collegiately. So Allen does have a bunch of potential. He's an intriguing prospect as is undrafted fullback Henry Pearson. So there's a few different ways we can go here. One, Tyler Davis is out. We know that the Packers want to keep four, some kind of mixture of four fullbacks tight ends, right? I'm inclined to say like one fullback, three tight ends. They could keep Pearson and then flip DeGuara back to more traditional tight end duties and go DeGuara, Kraft, Musgrave. Or... They get rid of Pearson, hang on to DeGuara at more of the H-back role, still have him do some tight end stuff, of course, and then hang on to Austin Allen at the tight end position, which is, I think, more likely the way to go. Now, they also could, because this is an unexpected development, they could look into free agency. They could wait on another cut from another team, some tight end, some Raz darling that Gudekunst is enamored with, right? We know that all of those things are possible. So this is one position that is very, very much in flux to this point. So ultimately right now, I'm saying the most likely path, I believe, is DeGuara at fullback and then Musgrave Craft Allen at the tight end position. But I will not be shocked at all if they go sign somebody else, restructure something, I think changes are coming here. The offensive line position. Let's get this out of the way. Starting, they should be in great position. Bach, uh, Jenkins, and then probably Myers, John Rennie Jr., Tom. Right? That's that's the that's been the first tier five all day. Now maybe they're gonna go with Bach, Elton, uh, and then Tom, JRJ, and Yash, right? In which case then you got Myers' depth on the interior. Maybe. Either way, those six are roster locks, no doubt about it. But then with the second wave, see, now you're getting into Caleb Jones, who did perform pretty well last night before leaving with an ankle injury, of which we don't know what exactly happened there. So um, I'm assuming he's okay since we haven't heard. Uh, Rasheed Walker led, I believe, the team in snaps last night and played quite well when he did. So Walker, Jones, there's depth tackles. So now you're up to eight offensive linemen, right? And I think the Packers are going to hang on to 10. Last year they did 10, the year before they did nine. And I think there's too many developmental pieces here that they're going to want to go under 10. I think they're just going to want two complete waves of an offensive line. So you've got your six locks, borderline starters, right? And then you've got Jones and Walker. All right, they're hanging on. Now you got eight. And then you get to Sean Ryan and Royce Newman. And amongst others, yes, Luke Tenuta, we are assuming at this point, given how that injury looked, given the fact that everyone came out and greeted him, that he was carted off, like, mm, looks like Luke Tenuta is probably going to miss the year. I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that. In which case, then you're left with like Hansen, Empey, Schneider, those kind of guys, maybe competing in the interior with Newman and Ryan for those last couple spots. What happened to Royce Newman? I feel like when he when he came in as a rookie, it was like, okay, this is this is not ideal. But hey, he's a fourth round rookie, he's surviving, right? And then last year he played some and it was like, dude is becoming the villain of the O-line. But he's not like Jake Hansen at right guard level bad, but he's messing up quite a bit. And then he plays in the preseason game last night, and he got a PFF grade of like 35, which is horrendous. It's, it's like every year he's played, he's gotten worse somehow. And yet, I'm not sure the Packers have a better option than just hanging on to him in the interior offensive line. Because really, like, what are the other options for the interior? Hanging on to Jake Hansen? Continuing to trot out Sean Ryan as he's adapting to NFL life still? Or are you going to go with a guy like MB or Schneider? 
I don't know, but I don't love it, your tackle depth is ridiculously phenomenal. You've got Bakhtiari, Tom's playing a great tackle, Yash, and then you've got your two developments in Walker and Jones who look ready to play more and more. Tackle looks great. The interior looks worrisome at best, with Newman and Ryan being your top two backups on the interior. So, I I don't know. I think, at this point, that what's going to happen is the initial starting five is going to be Bakhtiari, Elton, Myers, JRJ, followed by Tom, with Yash as the swing tackle, and then Jones and Walker there as additional tackles. Now, if an injury happens on the interior, then they kick Tom inside and allow Yash to play right tackle, right? That's the most likely, and that's where some of your depth for the interior comes in. But you have to go any farther than that, and things get scary because then you're looking at putting in Newman or Ryan, and I think that those are still two, the top two candidates, to make this roster as the depth of interior. Jake Hansen having his elbow injury is incredibly ill-timed for him. The Packers have a wealth of offensive linemen. I do think that this could be the year where he's out, and I've said that basically every year except for last year, so I still think he's going to wind up out. And then MP and Schneider, I think, out as well. So you wind up with 10 offensive linemen. Bach, Jenkins, Myers, John Rennie Jr., Zach Tom, Yash, Jones, Walker, Newman, Ryan. And yes, I am concerned. Let's skip to special teams. Kicker, uh -hmm, hmm, Mr. Inconsistency himself, uh, Anders Carlson, is the kicker. As of right now, he's the only one, so we're going with that. Punter, I know Dan Whalen has, has these booming punts that go on for miles, it seems like. But... I think Pat O'Donnell is still more trusted there. I think Pat O'Donnell may do the nuance of the position better. As I've mentioned before, I think his coffin corner punts are more effective because they come down like a knuckleball. I do think, given how much Bisaccia trusts Pat O'Donnell. Now, Whalen has held just fine to this point for Carlson, but I think Bisaccia really trusts O'Donnell. And so, at least for right now, I'm still going to give the nod to O'Donnell at punter. Long stamper, yep, Matt Orzik. Um, pretty easy call considering they gave him a three-year contract and the other one was a minicamp tryout in Broughton Hatcher. So, that leaves us a 25, or no, 24 players on offense. I'm sorry. 24 players on offense, three for special teams. And now, we turn it over to the defensive side of the ball. Where, again, there's some questions here. And it starts right away up front with the big boys on the defensive line. Obviously, Wyatt, Clark, Slayton, Wooden, Brooks. They're all going to be locks. Like, Wooden and Brooks were just drafted this year, and they were drafted high enough, they're, they're probably going to be locks. And Brooks, you know, sure, Brooks was like a sixth-round pick, but he's been playing quite well, so he's going to make it. In fact, I think he had two penetrations last night. So he's going to make it. And then, of course, you got your starters, Wyatt, Clark, Slayton. Do they keep a sixth lineman? They did last year. They kept seventh round pick Jonathan Ford last year and then deactivated him for every single game. They didn't move him to the practice squad and then elevated him in case of injuries. No, they kept him on the 53 and then deactivated him every single game. Are they really going to do that again? Keep in mind, a lot of times the Packers only trot out two defensive linemen because a lot of times their base defense is nickel. So they don't have three big guys on the field together all that often, especially considering that Rashawn Gary and LVN have the flexibility to kick it inside on the line at times. So are they seriously going to go with a sixth defensive lineman again? And I know Jonathan Ford had some good plays last night. He got some good pressure. I fully acknowledge that. And he is definitely the leader in the clubhouse to force the Packers to keep a six defensive lineman. But when you're looking at the totality of the roster construction, I'm just not sure how they can justify keeping six. Especially when you get to some of the later positions that I'm going to talk about with guys that have seemingly done more and could be kept above them. So, defensive line right now, I'm calling five. Wyatt, Clark, Slayton, Wooden, and Brooks. Moving on to inside linebacker. Again, I'm going to keep five. And it's mainly special teams rationale as to why. Especially considering Tyler Davis is out. They need some bodies on teams. Campbell, Walker, McDuffie, Eric Wilson, and Tariq Carpenter. 
Now, Campbell and Walker obviously are two starters. McDuffie is absolutely their preferred number three inside linebacker. Plus, he plays teams. Eric Wilson last year, in spite of only coming into the season, I think in like week five, was one of the team leaders in special teams tackles last year. He is one of the leaders of that unit. He also has starting experience at the inside linebacker position from his years back in Minnesota. And then you've got Tariq Carpenter, who still is adapting to the inside linebacker position, but is one of your key units of special teams. He's always out there with the ones on teams. And last year, he proved to be one of their most adept tacklers in the open field on teams. That's something valued, but the, valuable that Passaccia is not going to let just walk out the door. And then what that leaves off is Jimmy Phillips Jr., who's a UDFA, who has been playing pretty well. And he made some nice plays last night, too, including getting a couple pressures from the inside linebacker position. But still, I can't see them keeping him over anyone else. And I can't see them right now, at least, necessarily dropping all the way down to four inside linebackers because of the roles that these guys have. So that means they got to keep five inside linebackers because I can't see them getting rid of Wilson. He's too good on teams and he offers actual experience at inside linebacker. And Carpenter continues to be one of their best on teams in several different ways. So I can do get rid of him. No. So that leaves you with five Campbell, Walker, McDuffie, Wilson, Carpenter. And now, you know, I said, give me 54, give me 55. And it almost is entirely because of the edge position. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be honest here. I don't totally know what to do. You've got Hollins who continues to trot out there with the ones in Rashawn Gary's absence. So that seems to be like he's a roster lock, right? Then, of course, you've got Preston Smith, first round pick LVN. You've got Eneg Barre. And then you got Rashawn Gary, who's already off of the pup, which means he's going to be on the roster. That gives you five edge already and an incredibly deep five edge. I mean, look, look at that. What are they going to do? Move on from Enig Barre? No way. No way. Not the guy who came in and was one of the only ones to actually generate a pass rush after Gary was out last year. So, and then the rest are, are Holland, Smith, LVN? Like, obviously, they're not moving on from any of them at this point. And then you've got this sixth guy. UDFA from Florida, Georgia, so far, who's kept his head on straight who I have been saying had a quiet camp despite all of the hype around him. But I was very eager to watch him in a game. And then he goes out there last night, and once the Bengals send in more and more depth, Brenton Cox just becomes this man amongst boys and showed why against all of these depth players that had he not been kicked out of two collegiate programs, he would have been probably a mid-round draft pick, if not better. Like, his ability is clear, and he played some special teams last night, which we all know how important that is when you're a fringe guy looking to make the roster. He was all over last night, tipping passes, making tackles, and getting pressure. <sighs> if the Packers move on from him, if, let's say this, if he has two more preseason games like he did last night, the Packers will not be able to sneak him through onto the practice squad. But do the Packers need six edge? No, they really don't. But which one of these guys are they going to get rid of? So I got to do it. Right now, they're keeping six edge. Hollins, Smith, Gary, LVN, Enigbare, and Cox. I don't know how, but they're going to do it. At the cornerback position, this is a tough cut here. I do think Eric Stokes is going to wind up on the pup. Matt LaFleur was asked earlier this week if Stokes was progressing along with the injury guys, like Gary, like if he's close to getting off the pup. And LaFleur basically said he's not there yet. I think Stokes, given the severity of his injury, given the fact that he's got to get his speed back, I think it's perfectly reasonable that Stokes is going to open the season on the pup. And then that gives you Keyshawn Alexander, Razul Douglas, Keyshawn, or Jair Alexander. Woo! Jair Alexander, Razul Douglas, Keyshawn Nixon. That gives you three. And then Carrington Valentine. Well, sweet giggity goodness. He certainly, like, he's been making plays all camp long. And then last night he showed out in a game in a massive way. To the point where Larry McCarron was asking him about Carrington Valentine and saying, like, he belongs, right? And Lafleur, I'm going to paraphrase this, but Lafleur like dropped his coaching face for a second there and just kind of laughed and went, <laughs> you think? <laughs> I mean, I think it's pretty secure that the dude's going to be a roster lock. He is playing unbelievably well. But 
that only gives you four corners of Stokes on the pup. So who is that number five? Well, Corey Ballantyne was retained this offseason, was a great special teamer for them towards the end of last year. But at the same time, Innis Gaines gives them some cornerback play, gives them some safety play, and is also a special teams contributor. Now, Ennis Gaines has been out for the last week with an injury, but if he comes back anytime soon, I think it's him against Ballantyne for this last spot. And Ballantyne played quite a few snaps like that. I think it was the most defensively on the team. And didn't play poorly, but this may come down to Ennis Gaines. Whenever the twos have been on the field, Ennis Gaines has been the number two slot guy behind Keyshawn Nixon. Plus his versatility to play some safety, that may edge it in favor of Ennis Gaines at this point. So let's go with five corners. Alexander, Douglas, Nixon, Valentine, and Ennis Gaines, with Corey Valentine being a very difficult cut. And then the safety position. Oy vey. So the safety position, obviously, you've got Darnell Savage, safety one, right? No doubt about it. And then Jonathan Owens, safety two. He's continuing to line up there. So safety two. And then the next wave of safeties unequivocally is Rudy Ford and Tervarius Moore. And then it gets interesting. You've got Anthony Johnson Jr. out of Iowa State, the seventh round draft pick. Plus, you also have Dallin Levitt retained this year again. Rich Wasachia's best friend, captain of teams. I just said the other day, it's really hard for me to envision them getting rid of Dallin Levitt. And Levitt didn't play poorly last night. He did have an interception. He also... He also missed a couple tackles. We know that in practice, Jonathan Owens has begun rotating with Levitt at some of Levitt's special team spots. We also know historically, Dallin Levitt is pretty unplayable defensively. And Anthony Johnson Jr., despite not getting that pick that he realistically should have had last night, still played pretty well. So, I got five spots left. I can only keep five safeties. And so, I'm going to go with Savage, Owens, Ford, more and anthony johnson jr i hate this i hate this i it goes against my gut my gut says rich Bisacci is going to want to keep around down levitt he's such a leader on teams and he's he's a menace in pursuit and coverage but are they going to hold that spot for him over anthony johnson jr the only safety on the team right now who's under contract beyond this year because savage owens ford moore levitt they're all in one-year deals So are they really going to move on from the only guy who's got more than one year on his deal in favor of Dallin Levitt to be teams only? Maybe. I I wouldn't be shocked. But right now, I think they got to go with five. And it unfortunately leaves off Dallin Levitt. So we got some incredibly difficult cuts here. The running back position is, is difficult to move on from, right? It's difficult to keep only two there. At the cornerback position, Corey Ballantyne, safety, Dallin Levitt. You know, the Tyler Davis injury creates an opportunity for Pearson and and Austin Allen. But it puts a severe dent in their plans for this year at that position. So there are questions aplenty about this 53-man roster. And if you were to tell me pre the Bengals game, to put together a 53, it would have been easier to do so than it was this morning after the Packers Bengals game. Many, many questions left and many things to be answered. Thanks for checking out Lombardi Time Brews. This is a, such an exciting time of year for the Green Bay Packers as they are building their roster and starting to look pretty good. So. Thanks for joining me here. I'll be back on Monday with the training camp recap. I'll be going to practice on Monday. And then right after, you can see me post a recap detailing the ups, the downs, the goods, the bads, viewer requests, the whole deal Monday afternoon. I hope you have an absolutely fantastic weekend. And as always, Go Pack Go!